and has been uh, you know, very influential in the field, so I'm so glad to have him here. Um, so I'm, of course, newer to this field than Eliezer is, um, but I think the two of us will be able to answer, hopefully, questions. I think there, so in, in my breakout groups, um, it was very interesting. I feel that people have had very, very good questions and very good discussions. Um, I honestly, so I hadn't seen like the presentations on the Japanese research before I saw them, and I love them. I think it's really cool because they're quite different from what I used to in the West. And I think this is great. I, I really like seeing that slightly different perspectives, more focus on like um, decomposable AI systems, process oriented stuff that these all stuff I'm super excited about. But I definitely see that there's some unaddressed things here, like, you know, the very short introduction obviously was just like bird's eye view. And so I would really encourage you to anyone up here to ask any questions, whether they are technical questions, hey, why, how is this done, or why is this, to philosophical questions. Why is this important? What does this word mean? Any, anything like that. If you have the question, other people do as well. So please take the chance and opportunity to, to, to ask these so we can discuss this. So please, who's the brave one? First question. Hi, um, I'm interested in natural destruction hypothesis. And um, I think it's understandable that any different intelligence system have some abstract something. But I think it's nonsense to ask whether um, the two different intelligence systems have this abstract system or not. But I, I think the abstraction is hierarchical. So, and I think that the useful abstraction depends on the intelligence system. And I'm skeptical about the useful abstraction that is shared between the different agents. So, what do you think about any? So to quickly rephrase the question, is about the natural abstraction hypothesis. So unfortunately, neither me nor Elias or John Wentworth, who is the main proponent of this theory, I'm going to try to do my best to channel John here and quickly explain what the, and quickly explain what the natural abstraction hypothesis is. So the natural abstraction hypothesis is something like there are structures in the universe that are useful to think about. So there are some concepts that are contingent. You know, Whether or not humans invent anime is a property of our culture. You know, Maybe we come up with it, maybe we don't. But the concept of a tree is quite universal. Trees are things in the world. And even if we take, say, neural network systems, we train them on large amounts of images, even if they're completely unlabeled, very often, if you look inside of the network, you'll find like one neuron that encodes something like a tree, because this is just a useful chunk of the universe to think about. So the natural abstraction hypothesis is that there are un there are contingent, unnatural abstractions, you know, cultural things, words, you know, many words, whatever, and then there are natural things. There's abstractions that are part of your environment. So if I have two different intelligence systems, or three, you know, many intelligence systems that have a you know, chimpanzee, a human, and an AGI, all living in the same world, they probably will all have a concept of tree. So if this is true, then it might be possible to find these concepts in the minds of these systems, and then potentially use them to control or communicate with these various so John, in particular, I think is optimistic that by finding this, we will be able to find a kind of internal language of systems that we can use to describe goals or you know, mod understand what thoughts they have. So that's a quick summary of the natural abstraction hypothesis. So as for the question is, is that like, I mean, the question is basically, why should we believe this? So I think. Personally, and probably as we're happy to jump in if he disagrees with me here, some part of this I think seems probably vaguely true in the sense that um, if we have various intelligent systems that are on Earth, they will probably agree 
on something that looks like a tree as being a meaningful thing to talk about. The same way that thinking about a table makes sense, but thinking about the left half of the table and one quarter of the right half, but no more, is much less of a normal concept than just a table. So maybe some AIs have this crazy concept of half of the left table and the quarter of the right table, and they use this all the time, maybe. But you wouldn't expect, if you took another AGI, to it to also have that exact concept. But you do expect both of them to have the concept of uh, a table. Does this make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Cool. Well, is there anything you want to add on that? Well, well I was going to ask. Suppose that's true. Then what? Um, then you do a lot of interpretability work and find some concepts in there that have easy English or Lego, perhaps, equivalents. Um, <clears throat> but like, does that mean that there are things we want it to do, ways we want it to behave that are natural? I, I feel like a whole lot of the perspective that I've generally taken on these things is which things are natural, which things are unnatural, and I unfortunately guess that a lot of the behaviors we want are weird, strangely shaped things that don't look like the Meant like simple mathematical structures spotlighted by coherence theorems, nor are they a regularity of the environment that you need to hypothesize in order to make good predictions. Yep, so I think this is probably the main or so a little bit of criticism of natural abstraction. I do, to a large degree, agree with. Human values are quite complicated, as I'm sure all of you would agree with. And like all kinds of things that are kind of random sometimes, sometimes it makes sense. We all like, you know, not being stabbed. You know, it's something we can generally agree upon. But there are other contingent properties, and those might be really complicated to express. The examples of concepts I worry are unnatural. Happy, sad, alive versus dead in a way that will pick up on people in chronic suspension still being alive, and maybe you shouldn't have tossed them out the airlock. Um, what it means to like reasonably follow an order that you're trying to sincerely obey. Um, helpfulness. How large of an impact did your action have? How do you measure impact exactly? Um, so I think the, the research program for this would have to look something like, well, if the following set of concepts is natural, here's what I think I can do with them. And then I could come in and read through your list and point out three things on it that weren't actually natural, and then I would be able to destroy your research program. Successively. Yeah, I, I think the, those are reasonable hypotheses. I'm a bit more optimistic than Eliezer. For example, I expect actually helpfulness to be as natural as agenticness, or a, like the concept of an agent and like bargaining. But maybe he disagrees on that for reasons that I cannot understand yet. One day I will understand what he actually thinks. <laughs> we'll, find we'll find it out later. We'll find it out later. Anyways, let's move on to the next question. Do you mind if I just, you know, continue like this? Um, on this line, just I guess for the sake of my understanding at least. Um, are, is this idea of natural abstraction supposed to be observer or agent independent? Is it supposed to be, say, like, you know, this object as a property that does not depend on how I interact with this object? So it's a bit fuzzy, but basically, yes. So the idea is there are some, it's a spectrum, is that some abstractions are more natural, so you'd expect more agents or types of agents to naturally pick up this concept. Doesn't mean all of them, doesn't mean, you know, all, con you know, and there will be natural abstractions that are unaccessible to humans as well. Maybe there are, there's a, there, there are abstractions that I'm told are natural that are only accessible to the weird creatures called category theorists, uh, which I am not one, so I cannot verify whether this is true. And similarly, an AI system may find abstractions very natural 
that to us humans are not natural at all. If you want aliens that have no word for hydrogen atoms, you've got to go looking specifically for aliens that for some reason just never find it useful to think about hydrogen, because almost all the random aliens out there are just going to like, you know, naturally notice hydrogen at some point in their careers. Sure, I guess, you know, I was more thinking about tables. I'm not really sure that, you know, bacteria might find tables as interesting as I do. Yes, I think that's, um, so definitely importantly is different levels of cognition and interest. So, you know, there are people who find, I don't know, various forms of art way more interesting than me or, and they can find all these, notice all these different properties about it that I've even noticed and they'll tell me that's the case and this is right and I'll be like, sure. That's another thing that's kind of a bit separate from that. There is the, with tables, it's also, and bacteria in particular, bacteria are obviously too simple to have these kind of, like the abstraction of the tables, too, the same way that the, the, the abstraction of it, an economy makes quite a lot of sense to humans, but, you know, not tons of sense, but it's, it's something we can understand, sort of, sometimes, not really, but anyways, it is, but to, you know, as for some reason the theme is a rabbit today, I guess, a rabbit couldn't even comprehend what an economy could possibly. So uh, can I ask about what kind of model is uh, handling of the interaction of the, each agent, and especially about uh, how to uh, model the cognitive ability of the people? And I think it's a very good uh, yeah, required for society to accepting such kinds of AGI. So yeah, for the children, for the, some people with disabilities, or is there any kind of difference on the model? Or yeah. Um, so let me see if I understand the question correctly. There's the question, how will future AGI models interact with various like type members of society? Mm, yeah, more I want to know the model. How is the model handling about the difference of the agents, cognitive uh, abilities, to telling others? I, I'm, I'm especially uh, yeah interested about so, social interactions. Ah, social interactions. So, yeah, how how would... social interaction is handled in the, each model? So, so how would a system interact socially with humans? Not, uh, I think it's social is not only the human attribution, so, but I think the social, general social of the agent. Yeah. Like, like what does alignment theory have to say about multiple populations of agents interacting with each other? Yeah, yes, and the kind of serial minds, yeah. Um, so my, I, I would say that my foremost slash favorite technical contribution has been to the theory of how agents can coordinate with each other on uh, prisoner's dilemma-like problems um, with no pre-commitment with no pre-commitment mechanisms, um, with no ability to signal each other, only by knowing each other's source code, or perhaps so the theory here has not been worked out yet, having a guess about each other's source code. Um, we have a lovely paper on modal cooperation, which roughly means being able to have, if you have a bunch of systems that each have knowledge of each other's source code and are all using like the same system to prove things about each other, then you can show that they can improve mutual cooperation on the prisoner's dilemma instead of just running into an infinite regress of simulating each other. Um, because of Loeb's theorem, uh, but uh, so uh, yeah, what was what was the name of that paper? My favorite paper, and I can't actually remember what it was called. Robust cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma. Robust cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma. That was it. <laughs> yeah, to maybe give a bit of background, what I was just talking about, since not all of us know what you know. Once umlauts get introduced to the theorems, things get a bit complicated. A lot of Eliezer's work. Mary involves uh, work on how hypothetical agents could work together in different games. So the classic problem is the prisoner's dilemma, which most people have heard about, is that you know two agents can either cooperate or defect. If one defects and one cooperates, the one who cooperates gets lots of rewards. The one who defects gets lots of rewards. Sorry, yes. The one who defects gets lots of rewards, and the one who cooperates gets lots of and gets much less reward. If both cooperate, they get a little bit of reward. If both defect, they both get a lot of punishment. So obviously what you want as the dot eye observer is for both to cooperate. But this is very hard because each one well, the, the, the whole point is that there is no God's eye observer. Yes. Each agent would prefer that it defect and the other cooperate. 
But if they have to choose between both cooperating and both defecting, they would prefer that both cooperate. Yes. So an interesting property that Eliezer and his um, uh, colleagues proved is that in certain scenarios, AI systems that have these various properties can actually cooperate. Even if, like, even if you put them into a situation where you think you've aligned their individual local incentives to defect against each other, um, if they are quite smart and motivated to achieve an outcome for themselves, which is something else that is not that, then even if they don't have the ability to punish or enforce things against each other afterward, even if they have every opportunity to betray each other and collect rewards, as long as they have sufficient knowledge of each other's source code or just decision theory, they can very likely cooperate. So um, the like largely practical consequence of this is that, um, well, somebody here was like, what's the difference between alignment and safety? And I said, alignment is the study of what breaks when your systems get smarter. If you have a setup that depends on what you think are the opposed incentives of agents inside your system, to defect against each other and so ultimately cooperate with you, as it were. Like, or like if one of them is trying to trick you, the incentive that some other one has to call that one out, betray that one. Once they get smart enough, this will probably stop working. Another way to push it a while, but if they get smart enough to figure some things out, it will probably stop working. Yeah, uh, I think Ellie has really hit the core there. So what he's trying to say is the coordination mechanisms of very intelligent systems will look very different from humans, is that they will be able to coordinate and work together or defect against each other in very, very sophisticated ways that humans can't. So there are some things we can you know, guess or prove things about what these systems might do, but I think our guests will probably agree with this. We ultimately don't know. These systems are probably capable of very strange things. Is that correct? I, I would say that the, that the basic stance from which to analyze it is Suppose that all of those agents combined into a single agent that could take one coordinated macro action and get a whole bunch of utility for each of them. There's then a problem, which is how do they divide the gains? Um, and in turn, you have like various attempted theorems that and work still underway on like what are some mathematically simple ways to divide gains that the agents could all agree upon. But, but fundamentally, if they are smart enough, they can probably get it all. They can probably get all the games that depend on them acting in a coordinated fashion and then figure out how to divide them fairly. If you're assuming that they can't do that, then you're assuming that some very smart things, heavily motivated to figure out how to coordinate, will fail to figure out how to coordinate, even though the Machine Intelligence Research Institute has already figured out a lot about how they could coordinate and let's be frank here, put it on the internet before we knew that large language models are going to be a thing. So if it's, you know, if you're training it on the whole internet, they're definitely going to know at this point. So perhaps in summary, um, when we think about future very intelligent systems, we should very much consider that they'll be able, extremely capable of coordinating, working together in ways that humans cannot, and that humans potentially cannot. Because, because we can either ex allegedly exhibit our own source code to show that we reliably act certain ways under certain conditions, nor perhaps being too stupid ourselves, abstractly reason about the decision theories of other very smart systems. So like, we're both like too noisy to show that we will always behave in certain ways, and we are too stupid to figure out that other systems will always behave in certain ways. But you have them smart enough, they can both be clear themselves and reason clearly about others. And that is the condition for cooperation, which is unfortunately a pretty high bar for noisy, foolish humans to reach. Imagine, the AGIs are going to be even smarter than Eliezer. I already can follow what he's talking about. So, uh, let's move on to the next question. Simeon. Can both of you flesh out the most likely way you think we are likely to die because of the AI? So, I, a scenario. So um, I'm going to give an annoying meta answer, and we'll see if everybody else gives a less annoying meta, less meta answer or, or more annoying more meta answer. My annoying meta answer to this question is that I actually don't think this is a very valuable exercise. Um, there's several reasons for this. Um, the main reason is, is that there is something that kind of call like uh, you know, scenario whack-a-mole. So when you do scenario planning, not just for AGI, but also, for example, let's talk about war games. 
right? Like, or like hypotheticals or target politicians. Um, a very common thing is that you come up with a threat model. You come up with something, how things could go wrong. But it's just, you're just spitballing, right? You know that, you know, you, you didn't put too much thought into it, whatever, right? You're just, you're showing that it should be quite easy. Then it finds some teeny flaw in your plan, something you didn't know about, something you're, you didn't think that hard about. You're like, well, look, uh, I can see how I can stop this, so therefore it's not important. So this is kind of the, the classic computer security problem where if there's a difference between a security professional and a layman, is generally the layman will see, well, I don't see how I can hack this, so it's safe. While a security professional will see, I don't see why this is safe, therefore it can be hacked. And we should adopt this stance towards AI systems. These things will be very intelligent. So sure, maybe I don't currently see a way how thing, you know, this could go bad or whatever, but if I could, it could find something better. So I can sketch you scenarios, you know, if you want some prompts. Imagine you could have a thousand John von Neumann level perfect sociopaths working 24-7 without any pause or break, never getting tired, trying to, you know, make money or take over, you know, do something bad. How much damage could they cause? I've asked this question to some very senior people in national security, and they basically just looked at me like there's nothing you can do to solve that. If that happened, nothing could defend against that. And this is a very, 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 very lower bound on what AGI will be capable of. So I, I don't think it makes sense to really go into like give concrete scenarios beyond that. It's mostly just fan fiction at that point. I don't know what Elias would think. We've done some advanced physical analysis on various things where we can see how they could hold together, but figuring out how to put them into those configurations would be much more difficult. Roughly, mm -hmm. we can analyze that certain technologies exist in advance of knowing the like exact path we would have to follow today to get them. Um, it's all just a lower bound. All appreciation of the stakes in artificial general intelligence start from appreciating the power of intelligence, that it's not just like going to double college, but that like this is the stuff that separates humans from chimpanzees. Um, and you know, you tell people that and you get sort of blank stares, because what could it mean to go further along that pathway? Another way, metaphor for it is time. Not quite intelligence, but just like having run for a longer time is what separates the 21st century from the 11th century. There are things we can do in the 21st century where if you sent back the plans for an air conditioner, they could look at the plans, they could look at the description of how to build something, if you can figure out how to build some of the components there out of the stuff they had lying around at the time, they would be like, why does this make my food colder? Because it takes, because the plans that you have take advantage of a fact, the pressure temperature relation, that they do not know in the 11th century. You can, when something has, when, when a system around as smart as you has run for a longer period of time and understood new things about the environment, it has what you might in a certain precise technical sense call magic in the sense that it can lay out exactly what it will do, and you will not be able to understand why it would get the result it would get, because it goes through pieces of the environment that you do not, do not understand. So I can describe non-magical ways that something much smarter than you, and opposed to you, could attempt to kill you in the minimum time, using the resources that it has that it will plausibly start with, and that could be like the lower bound for how it kills you if it's as smart as Eliezer, but the, the sort of the, the, the mental motion to learn is like putting yourself into its shoes, imagining it as a smart supervillain rather than a stupid supervillain. It will not tell you that it does not want you to know that a battle has started until after you have already lost, because you see it, it does not want you to win. When you are imagining these scenarios, you want to win, but it, when it is imagining these scenarios, these scenarios does not want you to win. And can it manage to take out everyone before we know there's a battle on? Probably yes, if you imagine like what kind of technologies from 200 years later you can manage to get in a deep hurry if you were, could think as fast as you, more or less as fast as you wanted, but still needed to perform experiments. 
how we're very cleverly minimizing the, the number of experiments. And you're familiar with like the prior thinking that human beings have done in this area about what sorts of technologies are possible, what you would have to do to get them. There is a lot you can do if you can solve pro protein folding, now already done, and solve the inverse problems of what chemical reactions do we need, do we need which DNA sequences to fold up into proteins to get. Um, biotechnology alone, if you can think fast enough, push it far enough, probably suffices to wipe out all the humans before they know that they're in a fight. It goes further than that. The main thing that you get out of thinking about this at all is that the main way to win a war with something smarter than you is do not get into that position. Do not start the battle. Do, if you're going to win, win it before the point where there is something smarter than you that is actively trying to kill you. Your prospects are not good past that point. I think one point quickly worth adding to that is also, this was briefly touched on earlier, is the concept, is the question of just to remind of why would it do that? And so one of the standard responses to this question is um, sort of Russell, the concept of coffee, you know, fetching robots. The concept of coffee. <laughs> yes. You don't like the coffee robot? No, no, just say like. <laughs> so imagine you have a robot with an IGI inside of it, and let's say this is a pretty nice robot. It does what you tell it to do. And this is already a pretty good scenario. Now you tell the robot to fetch you coffee. What happens? Well, assuming this is a very poorly designed AGI, and it just accepts the scope of fetching you coffee, well, the first thing you'll do is just you know, burst through your roll, run over your cat, you know, get to the coffee machine as fast as possible so it gets to the coffee. So at this point, you're going to be like, oh no, this isn't what we wanted. So you run up to the robot to hit the off button. What happens? The robot stops you. Why? Not because the robot has consciousness or a will to live or anything like that. It's very simple. The robot simply evaluates two possible scenarios. Scenario one, uh, the off button is pushed. I am shut off. Result, no coffee. Second scenario, button is not pushed, I get coffee. Which scenario will the robot prefer? Well, since the robot wants to get coffee, it'll pick the second scenario. In order to achieve the second scenario, it must, if necessary by force, prevent you from shutting it down. This is, of course, a very simple example. But in general, if we have systems that are achieving goals, this could be anything. You know, It could be something like, maximize the stockholder value of my company. Or it could be just weird, RLHF, thumbs up, thumbs down, kind of alien, something, something, whatever. Whatever it wants, if it wants to achieve something, it probably wants to survive. It wants to exist, it wants to gain resources, computing power, you know, influence, whatever. So these systems will have incentive, even if we don't do this on purpose, by default, to try to gain power. And this will be dangerous for us, for all the reasons that we had sort of laid out. If we get to the scenario where we have something just smarter than us and that is doing something that we don't want, we probably already lost. Next question. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, a metaphor about um, this scenario. Uh, this scenario whack a mole thing that Connor was talking about. There's uh, a metaphor that I find useful when talking about this, which is. Imagine you are talking to a strong chess player who has a chess opening that they're very proud of. And they say, ah, and now I will play against Alpha Zero. And I will win. Um, and you say, no, I don't think you will. Alpha Zero is massively superhuman. You will lose this chess game. And they say, can you talk me through a concrete scenario of moves that Alpha Zero could make? that would result in you losing. And like, there is nothing you can do. I can sit with you at the chessboard and say, hello, oh, nice. I can sit with this person at the chessboard and talk about possible moves and counter moves all day. The point is, I am not as strong a chess player as Alpha Zero, and so uh, I can't convince you that you will lose. The thing that, the reason you will lose is because Alpha Zero is smarter than you in the domain of chess and has goals that are incompatible with yours in the sense that it wants you to be in checkmate and you don't want to be in checkmate. Um, 
And if you try to, I kind of flip the, flip the script on people when they ask this question and say, imagine that you were in my shoes trying to explain this, right? Uh, it's not a question, obviously, but uh, I, I, I find that helpful as a way of getting across that meta point that you can't explain a specific scenario. It, it is a good point. Um, I think this is a good point to add to that. Like, we can all agree that no one of us are as good as chess as some of our AI systems are. We cannot predict what our AI systems will necessarily do, what move they will play next. If we could, we would be that good at chess or not. Further questions? Hello. Um, so it seems that some of the research I'm interested in, and I've also seen some other people in Japan um, are on embodied agents and whole like brain inspired or explicitly modular agents. So what are your thoughts on how this could contribute to the development of safe AI? So I am actually delighted to see how much um, Japan is interested in these kinds of architectures. I am something of a reform end to end reasoner. Um, well, not reformed, not so much in the sense that I think end-to-end -end systems are still very powerful and probably the easiest way to get the AGI, but unfortunately. But if we want to have a, we want to have a chance to build safe systems, I think it very much makes sense to think about more cognitive architectures, more structured, process-oriented designs. This is something we work at a conjecture. You know, primary resource direction is kind of trying to reintroduce some of these ideas into the West. It seems that these ideas enjoy far more popularity in Japan than they do in the West. I think this is unfortunate. I think this is to a large degree because of the ease and great financial incentives of building powerful end to end systems. So I think there is a lot of, lot of very, very promising research in this direction. And this is, if we can understand any parts of the system that can be factored, can be, you know, made smaller, more understandable, less magical. So having a huge magic black box that does whatever, it is much greater to have a lot of small magic black boxes that we maybe can understand. And we can maybe supervise the processes. Yeah, so it was uh, very refreshing to uh, come here and see you know, slides that made mention of AI as it existed before 2006, where you would occasionally ever think about anything that went on inside your system instead of your entire system being an enormous black box full of layers of transformers, and that's it, that's your system. The tiny inscrutable matrices of floating point numbers. This is, this is AI in the West. Um, the terrifying thing being that this works, unfortunately. We would all be a lot safer if it didn't work. When I got into this whole business of AI alignment, I. You know, it was before the deep learning revolution, I thought we were actually going to have any control whatsoever about what was inside these things. That was not a sheer matter of gradient descent and outer loss functions. Um, so the, the warning note I have there is that, if, uh, is that if your modular system is going to play a role in the end game, it needs to probably work better than the giant inscrutable matrices of floating point numbers with no externally visible internal structure aside from the transformer layers themselves. It needs to work better than the end-to-end -end train stuff. And that means it's a capabilities advance. So if you find something like that and you publish it, you're bringing the end of the world closer, which is, you know, unfortunately not that great. Um, so, you know, Find the modular system with the clear internal APIs where we understand the messages they're passing between each other. That works better than all the end-to-end -end stuff. And then don't publish it. And uh, you know, if you get that far, talk to talk to Miri, and we'll, we'll talk you through it from there, more or less. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to add a few words on that. Um, so a concept that Eliezer and Miri have been pushing for a long time is that we should be very think very carefully about what information we publish and 
uh, change associated with it. So all the way back to, for example, Leo Szilard um, and you know the nuclear bomb, he figured this out, this might be possible, and his colleagues said, we should tell everybody. Everyone should know this. This is science, right? All science should be published. But Leo Szilard was of the opinion, no, we, we shouldn't tell people about this. This is really dangerous. This is really scary. Leo Szilard being the first person who thought up the idea of um, fission chain reactions that underlie nuclear weapons in his bathtub one night after he attended a lecture by Ruther for saying that they were never going to get net energy from nuclear reactions because he was annoyed by the blanket claim that it couldn't be done. As such, um, a concept that is um, at odds with some of the academic norms is that if you take seriously the possibility that powerful AGI systems are not aligned by default and may be very dangerous, then advances that lead to a us getting to AGI faster without an equivalent acceleration alignment is obviously extremely dangerous and should not be published. In my personal view of this, I don't know if Elias agrees or not, I expect that we are maybe two to five insights away from full AGI on the scale of like the transformer as an insight. I expect that these will be discovered over the next couple of years in basically random order. And if all of these get published, we'll have AGI very soon. If everyone keeps them secret, it's much less likely to single out with all of them at once. It's very unlikely that everyone keeping things secret is actually going to like be enough to prevent the headlong rush into capabilities far outpacing our actual demonstrated and ability to align them with the trajectory of that. Um, the I, I have a I started a prediction market. I bet in that prediction market. The prediction market is. By 2026, we will not have understood anything inside of a large language model that AI did not understand before 2006. People have, through great efforts, pulled off some advances in transparency, insight into the GPT systems that you know we sure didn't have before, and sure took a lot of work, and sure is a great scientific achievement, and yet. The structures that they found inside these things are 1960s era AI. They're the kind of programs people were throwing around in the 1960s. The large language models are much more capable than AI was in the 1960s. Whatever representations are inside them that permit this, we do not know what those are. And my bet is that we will be 20 years behind, that we will, that by 2026, our understanding of these systems, our interpretability of these systems will be lagging 20 years behind what we, at least 20 years behind what we knew, like our understanding will be lagging at least 20 years behind what we knew how to build, what we had invented for ourselves. Um, that's one way of quantifying the statement that alignment is like really moving much, much, much slower than capabilities at this point. So I, I do think that you know you have to talk to some of the people in America talking about other coordinated agreements and such things besides just like everybody personally keeps things secret, which is you know like a start for some of the actors with conscience to just if they find something really impressive, do not do not just throw it out there anymore. And Leo Silver threw the idea of, chain, of fission chain reactions out there. Um, that, that's a start, but you know that's not going to be enough. A lot more is going to be needed to slow down this train to anything like the speed at which alignment is actually moving at this point. So to summarize, um, in general, I think we would agree that these kind of uh, more modular architectures are extremely interesting. Any understanding of what happens inside powerful AI systems, understanding internal messages, APIs, abstractions, processes, anything is definitely interesting and useful. Um, but furthermore, if we actually want to solve alignment, including this path, it will probably lead to building a system that is very powerful and also very dangerous. And just because maybe you're very careful with it, you're not going to do anything stupid with it, but you can't necessarily rely on everyone else being this cautious, so you shouldn't tell people. Or well, you should only tell Eliezer. I'm sure he's happy to give you his phone number. <laughs> or, 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 or Nate Sori, who I think is also here. Is he not, yeah. There you go, the two, two dedicated people you're allowed to tell and give your doomsday web advice to. 
no one else. All right, great question. Uh, further questions? Actually. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to ask about, I think Eliezer had published in this uh, post about the uh, list of rules about like bright eyed scientists rushing into the, like creating an AGI, but instead it would be better for them to become like uh, kind of more cautious and, and like senior researchers. I was wondering like, what is your recommended approach in kind of gaining this caution before, or since we can't afford like iterative approaches? Well, some of us like just turn old and grizzled very quickly for reasons I do not fully understand. Um, innate cynicism or something, or just a predisposition to cynicism once it gets drilled into you. In, in fact, I am like sort of borrowing from the history of many other scientific fields where you can just like read about the bright-eyed optimists who rushed in early and like what what happened to them to turn them cynical. Artificial intelligence is full of people who thought that capabilities were easy and got slapped down by reality and they tried again and got slapped down again and they like eventually de developed cynicism and skepticism and a great field-wide attitude of learned helplessness, which then prevented them for many generations from ever discussing what would happen if they succeeded in anything, because they learned that only bright-eyed, crazy lunatics ever talk about anything in AI succeeding, because it always fails, then came deep learning, but it still took them another like 15 years to unlearn the habit. <clears throat> but yeah, so in, in my case, I, I think I just like picked up a bunch of it from reading history. Not just the field of AI, but um, evolutionary biology, for one side, and it, which is a, which, which is better yet, like the study of optimization, the study of how natural selection optimizes things. You have all this lovely history of like the early pioneers who were coming up with reasons why applying natural selection, which is hill climbing with the loss function of inclusive genetic fitness, would do all sorts of lovely aesthetic things. And the later people who were like doing the models and like this is not how the model pans out. This is not how the experimental evidence pans out. This is not what actually happens when you apply this optimization. You do not get this lovely, hopeful result. You get this dark and gloomy result instead. Um, but yeah, so so that's that's part of it. Uh, you could go to work in computer security. And that will turn you old and gray, hopefully, if anything can. But you also have to be paying attention. You've got to listen to the lesson being taught here and generalize it, and then like apply it correctly in the new domain. And this is magic mystery sauce, and I do not actually know how to. It's not how things usually go, right? Usually it plays out with the bright-eyed scientists rushing into things despite all the stuff that, you know, all the stuff that happened to their predecessors over the previous 200 years, because they didn't learn from, ex from experience correctly and generalize in the correct direction. So they rush it all right out, and reality slaps them down, and they pick themselves up, and they go rushing back in. Their second idea doesn't work, and they pick themselves up, and they go rushing back in. You know, like 50 years later, 50 tries later, uh, they finally crack the problem. And if we were allowed to do that with AGI, we'd be much less worried about it. We need, we need something weird to happen, to happen here. We need something ahistorical to happen. We need to, 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 to become grizzled cynics before we get initially slapped down by finding out that our first clever alignment scheme destroyed the world. Now we've got to figure it out before then, rather than after the fact, for what I hope are obvious reasons. It's definitely a recurring pattern in how um, it's very easy to be optimistic about things until you actually interact with reality. It's very easy to think how hard can you be to build an airplane until you actually try it. And you don't have the you know wisdom of generations of engineers before you to build on, and you know it's easy to think a computer is safe until you actually learn how everything works and how hard it is to be secure about anything. Um, this is a skill that's not super easy to. I think a lot of the bottleneck in the skill, I don't know if you guys agree, is emotional. People don't like thinking about nasty things. They don't like thinking about if I was a serial killer, how could I kill the most people possible? This is not a thing most normal sane people. Think about some people do, like me, and when I was a kid, and uh, it turns out the number is very high. Um, 
but uh, <laughs> just saying, just, <laughs> I mean, I have tested it, but, <laughs> no, um, for example, I was talking to a very senior person in government relatively recently, and he was with the head of state in an office, a big window like this, about 10 years ago, um, or five or 10 years ago. And he asked, and the head of security was there, he asked the head of security, what is stopping some teenager from flying a drone struck with dynamite through that window right now, killing all of us? And the head of security had no answer. He didn't even think about this. He didn't even, he, he didn't even thought about this. Drones had existed for a long time. Dynamite is not new. So people have not come up with this idea. By the way, I'm telling the story because he assures me this has now been taken care of. They do now have anti-drone <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't even bring up this. Anyways, Chris, do we have time for one more question? We've got time for one more. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, maybe someone. Hi. So I've heard lots of reasons why. Excuse me. I've heard lots of reasons why this is kind of inevitable um, that AGI is going to come about, and why it sounds like we don't have any way to, to stop the AGI happening or from aligning. Is there any hope that this is actually a solvable problem? I mean, I would be very surprised if alignment were not a solvable problem. Solving it on the first try, under the given time limit of capabilities progress, is a problem. Um, I think if everyone on Earth suddenly, mysteriously, had the correct strategic picture here inserted into their brains, I think that there's all kinds of things that we as a species could do about it. We could stop building the giant GPU clusters. We could you know, keep all of our computer scientists on a strict and equal diet of computing power, which would force them to actually understand the systems they built and have them not be giant inscrutable matrices in order to make anything work. And then things would be somewhat more hopeful. We could stop building the giant GPU clusters and engage in a crash program to enhance human intelligence using AlphaFold 7 or whatever, which would be like one of the few permitted uses of the giant the GPU clusters under careful supervision. Um, yeah, like winnable, yes. Are we actually on course to win it? Are people actually doing the things we need to do? Is there any prospect of doing these things? Is there anything like the degree of public understanding that would be required for the planet as a whole to see what would have to be done and do it? That feels to me very far away. Like, sure, it's solvable in principle, just not by Earth, is this kind of the impression I get. I unfortunately mostly agree with Eliezer on this, but for the sake of conversation or interestingness, I'm going to present a more optimistic shine of my model of this scenario. Um, I unfortunately agree with Elias, but I do not think we are currently on track. This is not the kind of thing that humans are particularly good at. This is a thing that evolves massive amounts of coordination against um, very strong incentives about very complex technical topics um, with lots of vested interest groups. This is not the kind of things humanity is usually very good at. So that being said, there are, we have not yet lost. In a sense, it is quite strange that we live in a time where things are clearly going off the rails, but we have not yet fully burst into flames. Knock on wood. You know, it could happen any moment, but we're not there yet. So the reason I say this is for several reasons. One is I think I think the alignment problem is marginally easier than Eliezer think it is. Um, well, I mean, given that I don't actually understand how hard he thinks it is, but I, from my understanding is he thinks it's quite a bit harder than I do, and I think it's very hard. Um, but it does seem like something that I don't expect to be a thousand x harder than figuring out quantum physics. I know maybe it's twice as hard, but I don't expect it to be a thousand x harder. Um, uh, you, you, all the hardness is from doing it on the first try. Quantum yes. physics would have been a very deadly problem if humanity had to get quantum physics right on the first try or perish. Yes. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. So the further thing is, I do think there are, I, I think there are more bits of evidence that we can actually get before having to try. Um, this may be something where I disagree with Eliezer, I'm not sure. On the coordination part, 
I do basically agree that we're on a very bad path, and this is something Earth is very bad at. On the other hand, I have recently been having a lot of interesting experiences. Where I've noticed that um, this this narrative that well, everyone that's AGI and a race into AGI, everyone is pushing so hard for it, does not actually seem to be true outside of Silicon Valley. As far as I can tell, no one actually wants AGI. If I talk to literally anyone who is not in the tech field, like no one wants this. They're all like, what? They're building AGI? So we'll stop them immediately. Immediately stop this. Cease. I've heard this from governments, from you know, the population, from everyone who isn't computer scientists. Everyone else hates AGI, as far as I can tell, and really wants it to stop, or at least be very, very carefully controlled. So unfortunately, of course, people who have no idea about computer science are not necessarily the people most fit to develop the kind of you know, structures to monitor and uh, you know, steward this development um, effectively. But it's something, you know, in case of you know, great glass, in case of emergency, there are options here. I mean, well, never mind great glass. I don't think we're going to have choice. Um, you know, we have this crazy scenario where there are people in Silicon Valley who will publicly on their company blog say, we think we're building existential systems, you know, that are you know, so powerful that they will, you know, maybe destroy everything, and governments are just kind of cool with this. Like, imagine if your startup just said, we are develop or your biotech startup, we're developing viruses that can kill billions of people. Do you think the government would be cool with that? Like, they would not be cool with that. Um, do I need to mention the NIH has continued fun funding of biological game of Give me this, Elias. Please. <laughs> <laughs> no, Elias is correct. Of course, the, the truth of the matter is is that if you are good enough at politics, yes, the government will be cool with this. But you know, to to end on at least a um, mildly optimistic note that it is well. So Elias is completely correct in that. This will probably not work, but there are scenarios where people have like sort of coordinate a little bit, like against human cloning before human cloning even existed. You know, there is there has been work to try to minimize biological and chemical weapons and stuff like this. Did it work perfectly? No. Um, <coughs> do I expect it to work this time? Also, no. But there 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 is the potential, and I think especially if the computer science community could more strongly come together and understand these problems and take them seriously. I do think this is possible. But as we just said, I think we actually agreed on this. It's possible physically. Nothing's preventing us physically. But whether we do it is a very different question. All right. all right, thanks very much. Thank you all for those questions. Really good questions. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. We know you guys will be around. Talk more later as well. Thanks, everyone.